נדמה לי, לפי הדברים שאמרו קודמיי, שמעולם לא הרציתי בפני קהל מכובד כל כך, אז לכבוד הוא לי. ואני אעבור לשפה האנגלית, מפני שזו השפה שבה אני חושב, שאני חושב באופן מקצועי, אז אני מתנצל על זה. אני גם מתנצל על זה שאני אצטרך Uh, לעזוב בשעה עשרים לשמונה, יש לי התחייבות אחרת. ואני אדבר על שתי דברים, ושתיים מהם שאתה יכול לקרוא לבית אדמירה ומודסטי על הכללות של החיים האנשים. הראשונה היא, איך אפשר להתחיל את האינטואיציה? והשנייה היא, It's not really a question, it's a description of competitions between humans and algorithms in, <coughs> in prediction. Judgment, a psychologist used the term, has an object and a scale. For example, a job candidate at the object and a scale of predicted success, or a sick person and a list of possible diagnoses. And the judgment, assigns a particular value to the object on the scale. This is very much like measurement. And in fact, we speak in the book Noise, we speak of judgment as measurement where the measuring instrument is a human mind. Now, judgment is typically complex. It integrates a lot of information. And it is, if you can compute it, the result, or if you can look up the result, that's not a judgment. Judgment is almost defined by the fact that there is residual uncertainty, that reasonable people can disagree in matters of judgment. In fact, it defines judgment, that people can disagree. And yet, some judgments are clearly wrong, and we know that as well. Now, judgment come, in, come about in different ways. And one of these ways, one of the more important, is intuitive judgment is a special kind, where, which is defined by the fact that we feel we know something without knowing how we know it. Now, that doesn't guarantee that we actually know it, but we feel we know it. And this is a process that I've called fast thinking or system one thinking. Intuition is sometimes wonderful and is often flawed. And that's the first topic that I want to talk about. But I will give you an example in which uh, I think a question will generate an intuition in you. And this is a very simple story. Uh, it's based, well, it's required on knowing the, the scoring system, the grading system in American universities, which you probably are familiar with, where four is the maximum. And I'm going to talk about a woman named Julie, who is a graduating senior at an American university. And, uh, and I'll tell you one fact about Julie, that she read fluently when she was eight, four, when she was four years old. That's the one fact. And the question is, what is her grade point average on the scale, on the American scale, of zero to four? And the point that I want to, to make, first of all, is that I'm quite convinced that every one of you has a number and that the number came to mind almost immediately. And I think I know how the number came to mind and this is what I want to describe. The first thing is you're impressed by, by the precocity, by Julie's precocity that she read fluently when she was age four. Now, this is not absolutely extraordinary. Many people read at age four. You know, if you had read at age two, it would be much more impressive, but it's quite impressive, age four. Now, then, so you had an impression of precocity. And what you did then, that produced the number on the GPA scale, is you took the intensity of the feeling about her precocity and you translated that directly onto the GPA scale. This is what just about everybody does. 
So if you have an intuition, it probably is a high number. It probably some, you know, at least in the United States for most people, it's around 3.7 or 3.8. It's not higher than that and not very much lower. Now, the first point that I'd like to make is that this intuition is absurd, statistically. This is not the way you should be thinking about it. Because this kind of thinking would be appropriate if you could perfectly predict Julie's grade point average from her reading age. But you cannot perfectly predict it. In fact, uh, the prediction of GPA from reading age is quite weak. What you should do instead, what people should do instead, the correct solution, is to start by assuming that you know nothing about Julie, in which case you would predict the average grade at, your, at an American university, and then you make an adjustment upward, probably, because she is above average in intelligence, but not a very large adjustment, because so many factors can determine her grade point average in addition to her reading age. So here is an intuition. Just about everybody has it. Most people who are not trained statisticians feel that it is quite reasonable. I can reveal a secret. Professor Alman, uh, to whom I spoke a few days ago about this, thinks that it's a very reasonable intuition. So I, I don't think so. Um, and this example illustrates three features of intuition. The first one is that you didn't answer the question that I asked. You answered another question. I call that substitution. You substituted the question of how precocious she was when in fact I had asked you, what is her grade point average? This mechanism of answering a different question than the question we were asked typically an easier question, is basic to intuitive reasoning. We do this all the time. And this is the reason why we're almost never stumped. We're almost never without an answer to a question. Because if we don't know the answer to the question we were asked, automatically it's transformed into another question, an easier question that we can understand. And we give the answer to that question without being aware that we've answered the wrong one. So that's the first process. The second process is matching, that you had years of, you know, her reading age is on one scale, the GPA grade point average is another scale, and you simply translated from uh, age to GPA without being aware that you were doing this, and that happened, and the matching is very close, the matching of intensity, and this is the way that people think about it. The third characteristic of intuition that is revealed in this example is something that I've called what you see is all there is. I give you one fact about Julie, and somehow you use that fact as if it was sufficient. You, we, our intuition, we use that fact, the single fact, as if it's sufficient to make a judgment. This is a characteristic of human judgment. Now, the, another thing that is illustrated by this particular example, is that our intuitions are often endorsed. That is, we accept the intuition as a judgment. This is what Professor Arman did, for example, that it just felt reasonable to him even after I argued against it. Now, so much for intuition, and obviously these are flaws. At the same time, it's quite obvious that intuition can be marvelous. So you have a chess player who is a master chess player who goes by a chess position, advances at it and say white mates in three or something like that. You have the physician who across the room can detect, can look at a patient and have a diagnosis from looking at the, at the distribution of blood in the face. So there are many marvels of expert intuition. And I engaged in what I called an adversarial collaboration with a colleague of mine, a psychologist, a colleague, an adversary, uh, Gary Klein, who doesn't believe anything of what I do. We have very different attitudes, and he is really a proponent and a great believer in expertise in general and in intuitive expertise in particular. Now, I invited him to 
we to discuss together the following question. Clearly, intuition is marvelous sometimes. Clearly, intuition is flawed sometimes. Where is the boundary? When can we trust intuition and when can we not? And it turns out it took us six years to, uh, to agree on something that is ridiculously simple when, you, uh, when we finished. But what we found, or the conclusion was, are there are three conditions under which you can trust intuition. And you need all three to be satisfied. And the first one is that the world be predictable. The world should be regular enough so that you can learn the regularities. And basically, intuition is recognition of the regularity in the world. The second condition is an opportunity to practice. Without a long opportunity to practice, you do not develop intuition. And the third, which is quite important, is that you need immediate feedback from reality. That is, when you make a judgment, when you make a guess, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't have to wait three weeks to know whether the judgment is right or wrong. You should know that immediately. I need a glass of water. Now, the three conditions, regularity, practice, and immediate feedback, are actually very demanding. And they're rarely satisfied. And so the conclusion really must be that expert intuition exists, but it's relatively rare. And most of the intuition that we have, like the one about Julie, but there are many, many others, they're, they're just false. We have, it feels like an, an intuition, it feels as if we know something, but in fact, we don't, because those conditions are not satisfied. So subjectively, incorrect intuitions are undistinguishable from correct ones. So it's not as if you have a signal that tells you internally, whether your intuition is correct or wrong. Uh, very often, we feel that we must be right because we can only think of one solution to the question. But the absence of alternatives is actually a poor indication of accuracy. Sometimes we feel great confidence in our judgment. It turns out that confidence, subjective confidence, is a very poor indicator of accuracy. The only valid basis for trusting intuition, I believe, and that's true for your own intuitions and for those of anybody else, is whether those three conditions that I mentioned earlier are satisfied. If they are satisfied, then there is a good basis to believe that intuition can be trusted. If they are not, then it's a good idea to doubt it. Now, what is remarkable, actually, is that in many fields, in many professions, there is no feedback. And this is true, I mean, let me give you an example that I've worked on a long time, for um, underwriters in insurance companies. They, they set a premium and they will never know whether that premium was too high or too low. There's just no feedback. And this is one of many professions. Radiologists get feedback, but they very rarely get immediate feedback, except in training. So uh, it's a very big difference, for example, between radiologists and anesthesiologists. Anesthesiologists get immediate feedback, radiologists don't. Now, people, in the absence of feedback, people still develop a sense of expertise and confidence. And the mechanism is, I think, interesting. You, people develop a sense of expertise when they begin to agree with themselves. And this is truly the mechanism. That is, uh, it was described to us actually in detail by underwriters. You know, how did you become an expert? Well, actually you become an expert when you recognize that you had a similar case sometime earlier and, you've, and you agree with yourself. You made a judgment there and you feel like making the same judgment now. And this mechanism of self-agreement is an important mechanism in the development of expertise. We've called expertise without feedback, experts without feedback respect experts. They're experts because they're respected. And I don't want to say anything bad about respect experts. I think I'm a respect expert. The, 
Respect experts are recognized as such, but they actually do not have feedback about the quality of what they're doing and saying. And that's sort of important. There were experts in astrology, and this is really useful to remember. That is, people who were respected, who were convinced of themselves, who were intelligent, articulate, they knew a lot, except they didn't know the truth. And they had no way of finding out that they didn't know the truth. So that's, that was my answer to the first question that I mentioned. And before we discuss artificial intelligence, I want to talk about another story, an older story, which is the story of comparing human judgment to algorithm and very, very simple statistical algorithms. And this story actually started in 1954. And, and it's a very simple story. When you give people, humans, a lot of information or some information, and you give some of that information to a formula, to a very simple formula, and you compare the results, the accuracy of the predictions. This is all about predictive judgments. I want to make that clear. Uh, when you compare the accuracy of the predictions, in about half of the cases, and there have been hundreds of studies, in about half of them, the statistical prediction is clearly superior. In the other half, it's about a draw. There are essentially no exceptions in which human judgment was actually better than a simple formula. And the formulas are very simple. Even very simple formulas turn out to be uh, more accurate than people. This is true for predicting violations of paroles, for predicting recidivism, for predicting longevity of cancer patients, for predicting infant death, for predicting the future prices of Bordeaux wines, and, and I could go on and on because there have been hundreds of studies. So we find that formulas do better than people, and we find something else which I think is important that when you take the human judge and you give the human judge the formula, they do worse than if they hadn't touched the formula on average. Now, there is one category of cases in which humans clearly do better, uh, or should, they should overrule the formula, and those are called broken leg cases. And the story is simply that if you're predicting whether somebody will go to the cinema, and you hear as an additional detail that uh, he broke his leg that morning, then you know he's not going to the cinema. And it's that kind of, in that kind of situation, when you're considering a loan and somebody has just been arrested for fraud, that sort of thing, those are broken leg cases. In those cases, humans should overrule the formula. But in other cases, the experience, as was mentioned, as Neva mentioned earlier, the experience indicates that overruling formulas is not a good idea. So the, the conclusion of this research, and it's a frightening conclusion if you're a human, uh, is, is that the last word should actually be to the algorithm and not to the human. That is, humans provide very good input to algorithms, but the final computation turns out to be more accurate than the judgment. This is really quite a powerful rule. And it turns out, of course, it's very unintuitive. People are uh, very confident in general in their judgment. They, accept, they expect to be correct, where chance would be 50%. People generally expect to be correct 80% of the time. For example, in predicting uh, the, the job success of people they interview. In fact, they're, they're accurate about 59% of the time. That is the gap between the sense of confidence and the actuality. So in that sense, I'm bringing really bad news, I think, about the quality of judgment. Uh, and but the data are really quite powerful. Now, what is the main reason for the inferiority of human judgment? And we know the reason. And the reason is inconsistency. And this is oh, what now I would call noise. And 
here there is something that's really deeply non-intuitive that I'm going to tell you, which is both non-intuitive and, and probably true, as a lot of research indicates, that when you have a lot of information that you have to combine into a judgment, the simple combination, a simple linear combination of just adding things up and weighting them, or even not weighting them, just adding things up, the simple is better than the complicated. Now, in intuitive judgment, what we do is we change the weights of different attributes for different cases, and we feel that's the way you should do it. You take a characteristic of an individual, and you give that a lot of weight, and other characteristic not so, and the next individual, you pick another feature, and you give it a lot of weight. This is where humans turn out to be worse than formulas. And actually, the sense that people have of being clever, the sense that we have of being clever, uh, we feel clever when we produce noise. And that's, uh, that seems to be what research indicates. So, I want to point out that the difference between humans and formulas is not large. It's small. And it's small because of another major fact that people often don't think about, which is that the world is really, true, really and truly unpredictable. When we are trying to predict the success of somebody, of a candidate for a job, there actually is no way from the information we have about an individual at this time to predict their future. We just don't know who their boss will be, how they will interact, whether there'll be an illness, whether there'll be an accident. We just don't know. And the unpredictability of the world is the main source of the mistakes that are made. It's not that people make mistakes in prediction, they do make mistakes, but the biggest factor is what we've called objective ignorance, that simply the world is often unpredictable. Now, what is fairly striking about this is now we have artificial intelligence making predictions. And in some of these cases, the database is so large and the techniques are so effective that we can be almost certain that we're finding all available information. And for example, in the prediction of heart attacks, when you try to predict heart attacks from a lot of information that is available to the machine, the top the highest risk, the highest 10% in risk, there is a 30% risk of heart attacks compared to about 7% for, for the lower categories. So 30% is far from perfect. And AI is not going to make perfect predictions because AI is going to be limited by objective ignorance as, as we are. So the difference is not very large. Now, one point that is worth making, I believe, is that the conclusion that people draw from the fact that there is, that the world is unpredictable. And the conclusion that people draw quite often is, if the world is unpredictable, I might as well follow my intuitions. Because, you know, we can't be right anyway. We expect artificial intelligence to be perfect. And when it is not perfect, we tend to reject it. But in fact, it cannot be perfect in prediction tasks because, because of the world is the way it is. So, for an example, uh, predicting bail, bail predicting uh, making bail decisions, there's been a huge uh, piece of research on that in the, the last few years, uh, I think close to a million cases. And, and in that prediction, they compared, and there you have an objective criterion, whether a crime was committed and whether the person actually showed up uh, for, uh, for trial. You, with using artificial intelligence compared to judges, you could reduce crime by 24% with incarceration rates kept constant 
Or you can reduce incarceration rates by 42% while keeping crime constant. That's straight AI applications of AI compared to judges at the moment. And it's clear, and I should add that, that giving judges the formula is they're going to do less well than if you apply the formula alone. We have evidence for that. So, um, there is resistance to algorithms. You know, none of us like algorithms, none of us like the idea of algorithms being better than humans. And in particular, what we have when we think about algorithms, we refuse to accept that they make mistakes. And the mistakes that algorithms make are shocking. So when a self-driving car runs over a person, this is not at all the same thing as when a driver runs over a person. Uh, and, you know, you have when an automatic diagnosis makes a mistake, it's much worse than if a physician makes a mistake. In general, there is a preference for what's natural and human over what's artificial. It's the same thing with vaccination. Think of how many children you would have to save to compensate for one child who dies from the vaccine. And it's not one to one. It's probably not a hundred to one. So it's a very high ratio and it's a very high bar for algorithm to pass. So my guess is that self-driving cars are already safer than people. But that certainly is absolutely not enough for us to accept them. Now, an indication of things to come. Uh, in China, there has been research on judges making decisions about bankruptcy cases chapter 11 bankruptcy cases, compared to artificial intelligence using, that uses basically only financial data. And artificial intelligence is much more accurate than judges are. And the idea is that in at least one Chinese province for this particular type of cases, they're going to implement AI that at least looks probable at the moment. So, uh, this is coming in the short term and in the medium term, however, uh, humans are going to make the decisions. And the question of how to improve the decision that humans make is absolutely crucial. Uh, you know, the progress in AI is going to happen whether, actually, whether we like it or not. This is, this is running. The thing that we do might have some control over is how to make th people, how to make humans think a little better. And that would be the topic for another lecture, but this lecture is finished. Thank you.